here. Y'all are the brave ones that made it. Come on in, everybody. Is this all today? Just the only ones that are so. Who, who, who? What's, what's, the, uh, what's the proper word I'm looking for? Who pushed past the storm to get through? Persevered, overcame the obstacles. Yes. I need a Let's pray in. Hey, y'all got to bounce the room out. There's too many people on this side. Some of y'all over here. Or you'd have be easier just to go there. All right. God is playing my hand. How are you going to do it? All right, let's open in prayer. We'll go from there. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful day. Even though it's storming outside, Father, uh, it's, it's always storming. Whether it's raining or not, Father, there's always a war going on, Father. But we know that you're in control, that you're on the throne, Father, and ultimately you win. So we thank you for that. We thank you for your son uh, conquering the grave. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our community, in our hearts today, Father. We ask for more. In Jesus' name, amen. I know it's, let me go get a brochure. Y'all didn't notice we have these out here in the front. just finished up the class called Foundations of Worship. Uh, every Sunday at 9.15 we have a class. Um, what's next class, I don't know. We haven't got that far yet. But Sunday, if you come at 9.15, you will know. Right. We have class, yes. Um, on Wednesday at nights, of course, we have a class also. Um, and that is Sonship, taught by Pastor Rick or Apostle Rick. Um, uh, I'm really understanding his role as apostle, and I'm kind of digging deeper into that. Um, and it's a very anointed class. It's help, it helps you understand your relationship uh, with the Father, and what He's asking of us, what He's requiring of us. And it's it's amazing when it opens your eyes that you are a son and heir to the kingdom that you've been adopted in, you've been drafted in. And the cool thing about being adopted in is you can never be removed. Adoption. Whenever you're adopted into the kingdom and when you're adopted into the Son, legally, you cannot be removed from that kingdom. So, if so you really understand that, dig into that deep, it's, it's, worth, it's worth doing. So, uh, we have these in the front now. Uh, we're going to start stopping announcements pretty soon. We did it uh, a couple Wednesdays ago. I really liked it. Uh, we were actually entering in worship at this time. Saves 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes of doing announcements and stuff that's redundant. We've already got all this stuff out here. Just grab one of these. It has information of who we are, what we believe, times, and then, of course, on the inside is all of our announcements of what's going on, what's coming up. And it's a lot more accurate than we are most of the time. Uh, uh, there are a couple of things we do want to point out, though. Uh, kids, boys, uh, we're, we have Royal Rangers. It's not here, but it's in Gatesville. If you don't know what Royal Rangers are, it's basically the Christian version of uh, Boy Scouts. Um, you kind of go through the same process. They have camps, they have uh, a paintball, they have knives, they have uh, uh, a lot of knife throwing, axe throwing, uh, a lot of stuff like that. And it's really, really cool stuff for the boys to go. They go camping. Uh, Josh Driver is one. Yeah. You said they go, but it's actually Troy now. Troy. They, they have what, once every two weeks they meet out in Troy? Yeah, they have a camp. Right. So it's, it's, we have an outpost. We're an actual outpost in Temple. Um, but we also can have one here. Joss is uh, pretty familiar with a lot of the stuff that they do. Uh, and it's, it, it's, it's really worth it because it gets the boys going, gets them outside, and they're, they're learning craft, they're learning stuff. They're men, mentoring boys, uh, which is good because a lot of uh, boys today don't have fathers or men in their lives. So it's a, 
it's pretty neat. It takes a little while for them to get going, but once they get going, they really enjoy it. They, they, especially when they get into the camps and getting into the other activities, camping, staying overnight at different churches and stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, another thing, we're having to have a picnic, which is kind of hard to comprehend right now with the storm we're going on. But we're going to have a picnic right the week after Easter. Uh, we're going to have, uh, I was doing a, a hot dog and hamburgers, but I think Robbie's talking about doing a, a, a brisket cook-off, which chop chop beef sandwiches or stuff like that. So whatever it is we choose to do, uh, we'll, we'll do it. We're going to have fun. Uh, we'll have hopefully have the volleyball net up by the end, and uh, we can start doing some outdoor stuff. We've got so much room out here in the back to we'll start utilizing it playing football and frisbee and all kinds of cool stuff. So that's going to be fun. Week after Easter. And then uh, the stirring. The stirring is in Temple, Saturday, April 8th at 6 p.m. The stirring is prophetic prayer. Uh, it's a quarterly uh, getting together for uh, of, of different churches in the Temple area, not just us in Temple, but it's it's a uniting of the community of, uh, of churches in the Temple area and Gatesville area to pray for our communities, to pray for our government, to pray for our schools, um, where we come together uh, and, and how the Lord leads you to pray. It's, it's initiated by worship, and there's moments in there where we actually join together and pray for our community, whatever the Lord lays on your heart. It's open to everybody. Um, not everybody has to pray. You can come just join together. Because where there are two or more gathered in his name, that he's amongst them. And that's what we're, we're hoping. We're hoping to pro promote and provide an environment for, for him to shine through through our community. And I think that's about all we got. Um, we do have some people wanting to become members today. But my wife is stuck in the office. Hello, Lorenda Payne. Time to come out. Church is getting started. Pastor Annette does the same thing in Temple. Pastor Rick, she, he's constantly going crazy because she's doing her own thing. It's like, I need you here to keep me in line, keep me straight. Okay. I hear her. She's, Josh had to go knock on the door. Yeah. Okay. She says she's coming. So, I don't know. Let's just get going. Let's just see what happens. Come on, worship team. Oh, we have tithes and offerings. A basket here. Somebody, some people have already started giving tithes and offerings. Uh, we consider that an act of worship. Also, if you want to do your tithes and offerings, bring it up during worship service. Uh, what is cool about our church, though, is we have a cool online website uh, that you can also give online. Uh, they also have a new feature off of our website that you can actually text to give. You have that number, Alan. If you wanted to tithe, just straight from your phone without even having to get up. There's a number right here. Um, I get the candles ready. Uh, dial, text to this number right here. Just text in the amount that you want to give, and it comes. You'll have to set up your account. But every any time that you want to tithe, once your account's set up, you just text in the amount to that number, and it comes directly out of your account. Really convenient, really easy, um, and uh, not a lot of churches have that kind of technology, so it's it's pretty cool. Uh, that's one thing that a pastor Rick and Annette really believe is, is pushing the technology. We have an awesome church app that you can get. It's called Elixio My Church. If you search it out on your app page, Elixio My Church, it'll come up. You put in the uh, church website information and you're instantly connected with the whole community between Temple and Gatesville. Uh, you'll you have access to what's happening, uh, the upcoming events for Temple and Gatesville. And you'll also uh, be connected with the directory of all the people that are connected in the church. Right now, they're all tied together, Temple and Gatesville, but they're trying to separate it and distinguish it uh, so you can just get Gatesville people if you want to do or Temple people. But right now, it's all one mess, but they are they're just got it started about two weeks ago, so it's a work in progress. Uh, the website is also really cool. We got a new website about two weeks ago, and it's loaded down with tons of information about the same stuff that's on here. So. Get connected, uh, use the technology, just don't use it during service. That's why we don't have service in here, so y'all can't be on your phones. Just kidding, God just worked that out, it's awesome. It's bad for me when I'm trying to use my Bible app, but hey, that's the worst. I'm trying to look up a scripture and it says, no service. Uh, anyways, 
prayer doesn't get inhibited at all in, in, in this building, so we're all right. You got any, anything else to add? No. no? Who was it that wanted to be prayed in today as members? Next week? Bring your whole family. And does anybody else want to become members with our church to join us? You feel free to come up here. I'm coming out there. Mike? Put cords on him. Everybody that is a member of the church already, just come up here, please. And let's lay hands on these guys. Come on over here in the center, will you? Right. Everybody that's joining. Everybody come surround them and lay hands on them. Yes. All right, Father God, we thank you so much, Father, for joining us together with these families and these couples, Father. I pray, Father, that if we become one, Father, as you commanded, uh, in a covenant relationship, Lord, that you bless all of us, Father. That we come beside these people, Father, that, that we help them grow, that we help them become to the fullness of who they're called to be in Christ, Father. That we help them with their families, that we help them in, in any area that they need help, Father. In turn, Father, we ask that they come into covenant relationship with us, Father, that we are always through our actions and through our words, glorify you in everything that we do, Father. That we come beside, Father, of those who come into the church behind them, Father, that we continue to grow and, and, and as a community and as a family, Father. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Lord, I ask that you continue to do great, mighty works through these families, Father, that you bless them mightily, that you bless their finances, that you bless their households, Father, that, the, that everywhere that they lay their feet, Father, be ground to be claimed for the kingdom. We thank you so much for addition, Lord. And I pray, Father, that as they come in through through laying on of hands, Father, that as they leave, they come and, and leave the same manner, Father. That they be sent out, Father, but not leave, leave through a fence. So we thank you, Lord. We know that you're doing great and mighty things as we grow, doing your will and your way, Father. Bless you in Jesus' name. As hard as it's been to get to this point, it's about to get a little harder. But in that, through Christ, you will understand that he's always going to be worth it. So even though the path that you traveled before to get here was one that you probably wouldn't want anyone to have to go through, but the path that you're on now is the one that you'll lead others to follow. Okay? So he's made a way to clear the way from behind you, but you have to seek him to go the way that he's called before you. Father, I just thank you for this family. Lord, I just ask that you will continuously, continuously answer, Father, that they will always seek your face, that their, their cry out of their own mouths will be, Father, your will, your way, always. Father, we ask that you will come into their household and you will mend the broken pieces that were made before they said yes to you, because you are Redeemer. You are Redeemer, and Lord, you will give back all that the enemy has stolen. Father, all that we gave access to, because we're the ones that opened it up, but, Lord, you're the one that comes in and closes the doors that we couldn't close. So, Father, we just thank you for that. Lord, we ask for protection over their family. But, Lord, we ask for an equipping to come quickly. That, Lord, they, they will have wisdom poured out, not just on the, on the husband and the wife, but also the daughters of their family. Father, that they will have wisdom beyond their years. That, Father God, they will speak the word. They will speak the gospel. And, and later on, they can see in the word that you were with it already, that it was already in them. So, Father, we just ask for your spirit to come upon them in a mighty way. Mikey, I thank you for you saying yes to this family. I know even though you will make your way to the pulpit, that is not the place that you're only called to be. That your ministry is outside of these doors. So, Lord, I know that even though he is willing to, to give his, his gifts and talents to you, Father, that, Lord, I know that it will also be a vessel used to draw those to you. But, Lord, he will always point your way. 
that even though those may be attracted to this gift and talent, that it will not be perverted, it will not be used for anything other than to glorify you. And Lord, even though every weapon, there, there may be weapons that try to form against them, but they will not prosper because Lord, he is unto you. He has been placed in your hands. So Father, we know that his ministry is not just here in this building, it's outside of those doors. So Father, we thank you that his tongue is blessed, that the words that he speaks over the people in the city, that it will all point to you, Jesus, always. Father, we just thank you that he is a man of integrity. He is a man of honor. And Lord, I just thank you that you've called him to be in this house as a representation of the Point Fellowship Church in Batesville. So Father, we just thank you for that. We ask that you bless his household. We ask for finances to come upon both of these families in a great way. Father God, that there's no other way than to say, Jesus, you are truly our provider. So, Father, we thank you for this day. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes. Actually, hey, hey come on back up, church. We're going to do it again. One more group. One more group. Come on. Lord, we know that Ooh, it's hard not to get emotional because we know that you are a good God. Father, we thank you for this family. We thank you that they come to us as one. Father, we thank you that the call that is in their life is the one that you have already preordained over them. Father God, we thank you that there are teachers and prophets and pastors inside of this group. Father, we thank you that there are those that will go and that will preach the gospel. But not only that, Lord, they will live it. They will be the examples outside of this church, inside of this church, in secret, privately, publicly, wherever you call them to be, that they will be the examples that you call them to be, that they will have not only made you Lord, but our Savior, they have made you Lord. So, Father, we just thank you for the, the, the promises that you have placed over this family. Father God, we know that um, there is a great work that, that has come and continues to, to be made known through them. Father God, we thank you for their hands. We thank you that they're willing to work for the kingdom. So, Father, I'm, there's honor in that. There is honor. There's one thing to say that you'll do for Jesus. It's another thing to actually do for Jesus. So, Father, we thank you that their hands are ones that will work. But, Father, I thank you that even in their secret place, even in their secret time before you, the Lord, they truly are working to build up and to tear down, the, to, to, to tear down the walls that have been made around people around them, but Lord, that they will also be one that will build up boundaries to also those that are around them, that Lord, they will speak life, they will speak life to all those that they come in contact with. So Father, I just thank you for the blessing and the covenant that this, they're willing to make with us. Father, I pray that we do right, The Father God, that this will be a house of family, this will be a house of one, because truly Jesus, we want to always point and direct everything to you. Father, we just thank you for this addition to our family. Lord, we say thank you because you're the one that calls us to the body. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Hey, Shane. Um, I wanted to, do you, do you mind sharing from last week? Can I give a brief highlight? Okay, okay. All right, I got to, I'm going to share something real quick from Shane here and, and his family who just joined the church. Last week, uh, I was, I guess during worship, I had the, the was led by the Spirit to, to talk about you have not because you ask not. And it was really laid on my heart that a lot of things, and actually Pastor Lorenda and Pastor Ned have been speaking about this a lot, so that you, you, we have a lot of, we don't have a lot of things going on because we're not asking or verbalizing these things out of our mouth. So uh, 
as soon as I shared that, right after church, Shane and his wife came up to the, to the front. They, I guess earlier that day they had posted on Facebook that they were in need of some trucks and some trailers. They were needing some help. And I said, well, what was all that about? And they said, well, a couple years ago we had put our whole entire household in the storage um, and had been, I, I'm not sure why, that's between them, but they put all their stuff in the household and had been paying on that for about a year. And then something happened, um, and they had skipped a few payments. And, yeah, he, and eventually, he, I guess, thinking that what storage facilities normally do is sell that stuff off to recoup their money, uh, he, after a year's time, he came back and he decided, no, I, maybe I need to call them and see if they have it. So he, he called, uh, he asked them, said, do you by chance still have all of our stuff. I said, yes, I do. And so he worked out a deal with the guy, was able to purchase back all of his stuff at 50% off of what it would have cost him if he'd have paid the full price. And after a year's time, was able to re-get or, or reclaim everything that was in that storage room. Um, all because, all because he asked, all because he picked up the phone and said, hey, do you have it? It's a testimony that we have not because we ask not because he was under the assumption that they're going to sell this stuff off. And he even asked the guy, he said, how come you didn't ever do that? He says, I don't know. I don't know why. That's not what I do. I usually sell this stuff after two or three months, but yours is still here. So it's a testimony uh, to, to speak those things. Ask. You'd be surprised what God has already ordained and has put ahead of us. So, all right. Okay, so I've covered tithes and offerings. I've covered announcements. We've created new members. We've got testimonies. We can go home. No? Okay, let's give some worship. Let's, let's rise to our feet. Let's give worship to God. Yes. Y'all, uh, y'all, actually, y'all need to get uncomfortable. Come out from behind. Come join these teenagers up here in the front. And let's, uh, let's worship him unhindered. Let's, uh, let's put away this week. Let's put away what's going to happen next week or what we think is going to happen next week. And we offer a worship to you, Lord, Father, that's unadulterated, Father, that's pure and is truly to, to give back to you, Father, for what you've done for us, Lord, Father. We, we, we repent, Father, of any kind of sins that we have, Lord, as a body. Let us be the fullness of what you have for us, Father. If we have a, 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 an offense against our brother, let us go to that brother, Father and ask for forgiveness, and then come back and give worship to you this day, Father. We thank you so much for what you're doing amongst us, Lord, and I know great things are ahead, Father. Victory is yours. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Good morning, family. It's not a beautiful day outside. I absolutely love the rain and the thunder. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. There's, there's a couple new songs in this set that, you know, we've never done before. Let's just go have a little fun with it. We strike the crown on the wells of revival. Press for, burst for. We strike the crown on the wells of revival. Press for, burst for. Cause there's a war going on in the heavenlies. And we're tearing down wicked principalities. There's a war going on in the heavenlies.
You know, whenever we were leaving uh, Temple, that was the word, that, that song right there was the last, whenever I preached there, um, before we moved over to Gatesville. And I remember the Lord saying, go strike the ground. Go strike the ground for revival. You know, whenever, I think it was, and you can correct me and help me, was it Jacob's wells that they came and they stole and he had to go and go to a new land and, and make more and get more? Well, he had to go and he had to strike the land. He had to go strike the land. He had to go see, because even though there may have been some things that had been stolen, he knew that there were things that were going to be fresh and anew. But guess what? The fresh and anew and the things that were stolen all were for the kingdom. So that's what we have to know and that's what we have to do. What ground are we striking? What are we going to do for revival? Revival of what? Does your marriage need revival? Do your children need revival? Does, does your heart need a revival? Because we know that if we strike the ground for revival, he will burst forth out of what you have inside of you. Because if you said yes to Jesus, there is a living God inside of you. And that's what bursts forth. So, Father, we say yes to you this morning because we are willing to strike the ground for revival. Strike my heart, Lord, because I know there's still areas that are dead and that haven't been awakened. Lord, we ask for you to come in a mighty way. Burst forth, Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way. This rain is a beautiful rain. It was not one of defeat. It is one of victory. So, Lord, we thank you for the rain. And we thank you for the people that burst forth and press forward to come into this house today. Thank you, Jesus. stop singing this song in temple because every time they sang it it would flood and I pray that that happens in this house right here right now that there be a revival come to this house revival come to each one of us individually father that each each one of us opens up our hearts to receive the outpouring of your rain father your grace your mercy father we pray father that you continue to revive us father bring us back from the dead in, in the hardened areas of our hearts father that's what I mean 
or the calloused areas of a harsh word would become uh, uh, super critical or, or insensitive to what's going on around us, Father. That we truly see people through your eyes, Father. That we truly see the situation through your eyes, Father. That we ultimately believe in our hearts the revival is coming to stay, Father. Send the rain, Father. Grace like rain, abundant and thorough, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
my feet Bring out my mouth In the darkness, please When I move my body When I move my feet Bring out my mouth In the darkness, please When I move my body When I move my feet When I move my mouth In the darkness, please When I move my body When I move my feet
relationship with my wife, the way she knows that I love her, because I show her I love her through acts of giving, through expression, maybe it's just that look that she knows, he really does love me and he cares for me, but I have to put action behind just the words, I love you. I could say I love you all day long, but I have no expression through my actions, and I'm not really expressing love to the fullest. I say all that because what does expression of love look like to the Father? Do we have an action behind it that expresses our love to Him? Or are we just saying the words? I challenge you. For me, when I first started, this was an giant obstacle was just to raise my hands just to get them up off my hips or get them off uncrossed and just open myself up and say Lord I surrender to you not in a, I have to surrender to you there's a gun pointed to me I, I give up but a surrender saying here I am fill me up so if this is all that you can do Raise your hands, and I challenge you, raise them right now. Raise them to him and say, Lord, use me. I love you. Thank you, Lord. And if it's jumping and running around the room, then feel free. Whatever your expression is, give it to him and give it all to him. Express your love. Amen.
You are 
you are worthy. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory. Let's sing it again. You are worthy of it all. hard to move on, but I'm thankful that we have this opportunity to hear your word. So Father, I ask that the word that you prepared and that you placed in my heart, that Father, that it is truly of you and everything that is of me, that it will not be remembered. Father, I ask that I completely de decrease as the Spirit of the living God will increase inside of me. May we give you honor. May we give attention to your word. Be attentive. And also be directed. Because you definitely want to show us something. Thank you. 
I know that I have to record this word, and I asked his permission first, but I saw you on a crossroad, and the Lord was very, very, very specific about this crossroad, and he showed me, I don't know if you've ever driven to Bryan Color Station, but you come to a point where you can either go left or right, but I saw that particular sign right there, and I always go left, and it's just repetition for me to go left, because normally that's the direction that I'm going. The Lord said that you have come to a stopping point. And you know specifically you have to make a choice to the left or to the right, okay? Now, right behind that that sign, I don't know if there's a, a motel there or not, but I saw a motel. And the Lord said, if you don't make a decision, you're going to camp in a, in, a, in a temporary housing. And you're, it's not, not meant to be for a long time, but eventually you're going to have to make a choice to either go left or right. You're going to stay there. So... But in that, you want to be very attentive to the to the, the yes to the left and the yes to the or the no to the right, whichever way. You want to be very attentive. But the Lord said he's in either direction. So that's the thing about it, is that a lot of times we're like, I don't want to make a wrong choice. I don't want to make another bad decision. But the Lord is very clear about you seeking him and being sure of your yes and being sure of your no. Because in that, he can come, okay? Because you're submitting it unto him. So, honey, I don't know if that has anything to do with what you just said to them, but I ask you to seek the Lord on it because this was very specific about you. So, in that, ask him. He's in, we are in the season of answers. So, we have not because we ask not. And because we don't seek his face and we go off our feelings, we lose it. So we cannot go based off emotions. We have to go off truth. What does his word say? His word's alive in you. It's not dead. It's alive. Okay? So you know it. So don't doubt it. Okay? Thank you, Jesus. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Where'd your son go? Cody. Hey. God had a target on him, too. I loved it, though. Oh my goodness. Thank you guys. Mm. My goodness. You know, You know, Tyler and I don't collaborate. Actually, I didn't know where this message was going until, what, 11 o'clock last night because totally went a different direction. But I love Jesus, and I love my husband, and I thank him for his obedience. He was reading, he's reading a, a Danny Silk's book, and um, so he's reading while I'm studying. And he says, honey, can I interrupt you for a minute? And I was like, oh, you always try to talk to me when I'm studying. And... 
I said, yeah. I was actually sweet about it, so that's probably why he told me. And, because that's not normal. And I said, sure. He said, told me some stuff that the Lord was showing him. I was like, honey, that's the last piece that I needed. And he was like, no, if you don't use it, I'll keep it. He said, because that's a good word. I said, I know, but it's the key that I needed. But the cool thing is, is that even in us talking, Tyler had no idea. And um, there's a song that he put in our, in our list today. And you'll find out which one it is in a minute. The last time I ministered, I talked about the wilderness. That trying to bypass the wilderness is like trying to bypass the cross. Can't do it. True freedom to the promised land required us to go through the wilderness to the promised land. But how long it took them was dependent on them. Just like how long it takes us is dependent on us. It can take us 40 years or it can take us 11 days. So I challenged us the last time and asked the question, what do you want? What do you want God to answer? What did he tell you would happen? And you haven't seen it happen, so you can't believe it anymore. I had a very interesting conversation with a wonderful young lady on Friday. She jacked my heart up. Miss Sarah came and she sat with me and introduced herself to me. And I told her, I, I, I know, I'm gonna have to, I have to embarrass you a little bit. But... In our conversation, she's just sharing who she is. And I am like hanging on to every word that is coming out of her mouth. Because for one, I had already had a crazy week. Two, I know specifically what I asked God for that morning. And then in walks this wonderful woman, beautiful smile on her face, sits down in front of me and is like, here I am. And I'm like, here you are. And she just began to tell me about herself. But she made a comment to me about, um, I don't want to give too much of of hers, because I want her to be able to share it herself. But she told me about a, you know, we're all called to write down our testimonies and, and to tell our stories. Because believe it or not, your life is not your own. It's not all about you. And I know, this young lady wrote a book. If you haven't had a chance to read it, um, you need to. And um, there are other book writers in this building. And there are other people that need to share their testimonies with the brothers and sisters in this room. So you may not think what you have is worthy of repeating. But I tell you, when it leads to Jesus, you need to tell somebody. So she had made a comment about a particular chapter that she had. And was it, if only, or is that the, what it was, two words? If only. And I said, what? So I'm going to read the scripture because she told me what scripture was based off of. It was in Mark 5.24. So Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that the healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. So she highlighted something in the scripture that I have never, ever paid attention to, if I can. 
if I can. If you could only. How many if only moments do we have in our life? I had a ton, and I wrote them all down, and I'm not going to say them all. <laughs> but I went back to my word about the wilderness, and I found that in their if only moments was a little bit different than this woman's if only moment. So in Exodus 16, 3, it says, If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around, pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Their if only moment looked a little bit different than her if only moment. Amen? I want my if only moment to be hers. But I find myself living Exodus 16.3. So this really, really got me thinking. I've said many, many times, if I would have only gone to college, where would I be? If only my parents wouldn't have divorced and we stayed in Amarillo, where would our family be? Because our family was one there. If only my real dad raised me, where would I be? Would I have abandonment issues? Would I have rejection issues? What if I would have had a youth pastor speaking into my life the word of God? Or better yet, what if my parents would have been saved and spoken to my life? Where would I be? I kept thinking of two different scenarios there with the if only. One said, if I could only touch the hem of his robe and did it. The other said, if God would have just left us in Egypt, which Egypt is bondage. We may have been prisoners and slaves, but hey, at least we ate and had water. We had stuff to eat and drink. What moments do you have like this? What if only moments can you think of? Or is it just me? Is it just me that does that? I'm stunned. I asked God Friday morning, Friday morning, did I hear you? And in walks this woman that says, you hear him, Lorinda. Not out of her mouth, but the spirit inside of her said, I love you so much, baby, and I'm not going to make you torment yourself all weekend, so I'm just going to go ahead and take care of this right now. But I want to give two other examples of if only. I'm actually going to tell you a story about Abraham and Lot. We know that Abram was Lot's uncle. And at first I wasn't going to read this because I was like, I, most people know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, but the Lord said no. So take it up with him if I take too long. It says, we know that Abram was Lot's uncle and Abram had petitioned God in Genesis 18. It says in 1816, then the men got up from their meal and looked out towards Sodom. As they left, Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Should I hide my plan from Abraham, the Lord asked, and Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. So the Lord told Abraham, I have, a, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. I'm going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I have heard. If not, I want to know. The other men turned and headed towards Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham, and Abraham approached him and said, will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? How many of us do that? Do we all really, are we all really going to go? Not as bad, exactly. I'm not that bad. I'm kind of bad. I'm not that bad. Suppose you find 50 righteous people living in the city. Will you sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Why would you be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same? Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the Lord replied, if I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the entire city for their sake. Then Abraham spoke again. He said, since I have begun 
Let me speak further to my Lord. Even though I am not but dust and ashes, suppose there are 45 righteous people rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? The Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. Then Abraham pressed his request further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 40. Please don't be angry, my Lord, Abraham pleaded. Let me speak. Suppose only 30 righteous people are found. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it if I find 30. Then Abraham said, since I have dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there are 20. The Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. Finally, Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me. If I speak one more time, suppose only 10 are found there. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of the 10. When the Lord had finished his conversation with Abraham, he went on his way and Abraham returned to his tent. I'm going to go to 19. That evening, two angels came to the entrance of the city of Sodom. Lot was sitting there, and when he saw them, he stood up to meet them. Now, what, if you don't know this about Lot, Abraham had already, this was before this, right? When he gave him his part. So Abraham was already gracious to Lot in the beginning. So here he is on his part, and... It says, then he welcomed them and bowed his face to the ground. My lords, he said, come to my home to wash your feet and be my guest for the night. You may then get up early in the morning and be on your way again. Oh no, they replied. We'll just spend the night here in the city square. But Lot insisted. So at last they went home with him. Lot prepared a feast for them, complete with fresh bread made without yeast, and they ate. But before they retired for the night, all the men of Sodom, young and old, came from all over the city and surrounded the house. And they shouted, where are the men who came, who came to spend the night with you? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. So Lot stepped outside to talk to them and shutting the door behind him. Please, my brothers, he begged, don't do such a wicked thing. Look, I have two virgin daughters. Let me bring them out to you and you can do with them as you wish. But please leave these men alone. For they are my guests and are under my protection. Stand back, they shouted. This fellow came to town as an outsider, and now he's acting like our judge? We'll treat you far worse than those other men. And they lunged towards Lot to break down the door. But the two angels reached out, pulled Lot into the house, bolted the door. Then they blinded all the men, young and old, who were at the door of the house. So they gave up trying to get inside. Meanwhile, the angels questioned Lot. Do you have any other relatives here in the city? They asked. Get them out of this place. Your sons-in-laws, your sons, your daughters, or anyone else. For we are about to destroy this city completely. The outcry against this place is so great that it has reached the Lord and he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot rushed out to tell his daughter's fiancés, Quick, get out of the city. The Lord's about to destroy it. But the young men thought he was only joking. At dawn the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry, they said to Lot. Take your wife, your two daughters who are here, and get out right now, or you will be swept away in the destruction of the city. When Lot still hesitated, the angels seized his hand and the hands of his wife and two daughters and rushed them to safety outside of the city, for the Lord was merciful. When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, Run for your lives. Don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you'll be swept away. Oh no, my Lord, Lot begged. You've been so gracious to me and saved my life. And you have so, shown such great kindness. But I cannot go to the mountains. Disaster would catch up to me there and I would soon die. See, there's a small village nearby. Please let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. All right, the angel said, I'll grant your request. I will not destroy the little village, but hurry, escape to it, so I can do nothing until you arrive. Lot reached the village just as the sun was rising over the horizon. 
Then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. He utterly destroyed them, along with the other cities and villages of the, of the plain, wiping out all the people and every bit of vegetation. But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Abraham got up early that morning and hurried out to the place where he had stood in the Lord's presence. He looked out across the plain towards Sodom and Gomorrah and watched as columns of smoke rose from the cities like smoke from a furnace. But God had listened to Abraham's request and kept Lot, Lot safe, removing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities of the plain. Key point that I really want you to pay attention to is that the angel is the one that grabbed Angel seized his hand and the hands of his wife and the two daughters. Okay? The angel grabbed him. He seized him and said, God heard Abraham's cry to save you. So he considered not going, but the angel seized him. That's key. Even though Lot took his, daughter, his two daughters and his wife... His wife still had to turn around and look back one more time. And what happened to her? <sighs> Scared the... Yes! Out of me. Totally. I sat there last night and I kept thinking of, uh, you know, because Facebook is all full of, hey, let's see where so-and-so is now. Let's see where so-and-so is now. And the Lord reminded me of a time where I was like, hey, I wonder where so-and-so's at. And he was like... Keep looking back. And I said, I'm, I'm in my room. James is dead asleep. And I am, I am up repenting. And I said, Jesus, I'm sorry for looking back. Because if I truly say that I'm thankful for where I've been saved from, why would I want to look back? What? I actually made this comment to my husband. I'm about to confess something that I pray none of you ever use against me. But right after we... <laughs> Yes, say it. I remember having a conversation with my husband one day. And I'm steadily washing dishes. And I had this thought come over me about God's grace and his forgiveness. And I said, honey, I know I've done some messed up things. But what would happen if I would have known how good God's grace was and how much more would I have tried to get away with? He just kind of looked at me like, you are the devil. And I said, I, I know. But that's how much I finally understood his grace and his forgiveness. And I'm like, maybe I would have gone there. Maybe I would have done that. Maybe I would have tried that. Because I knew that once you come to the line, you can't go back. But I had already crossed the line. There wasn't going back. I already knew. But what I didn't realize is my, what I consider bad may not be what other people consider bad. But I don't want to look back. I don't want to be the one that says, let me catch one more glimpse. I've been faithful to my husband for years. And I don't want to look back to my prior days of being unfaithful and saying, what if? What if? I didn't move here. What if we didn't come to Gatesville? What if I never said yes to the point? What if I never moved to Temple? What All of this. I'm like, I want to look forward because I know Jesus is in my future. And that's where I want to press forward. Destruction is behind us, guys. It's an evident because there are some things we put our hands to that need to be consumed. So I'm going to read out of Genesis 19.30. Afterward, Lot left Zoar because he was afraid of the people there, and he went to live in a cave in the mountains with his two daughters. One day, the older daughter said to her sister, there are no men left anywhere in this entire area, so we can't get married like everyone else, and our father will soon be too old to have children. So come, let us get drunk with wine. We'll go in. We'll have sex with him. That way we can preserve our family line through our father. So that night, they got drunk with wine. The older daughter went in, had intercourse with her father. He was unaware of her lying down or getting up. 
The next morning, the older daughter said to her younger sister, I had sex with our father last night. Let's get him drunk with wine again tonight. Go in, have sex with him. That way we'll preserve our family line through our father. So that night, they got drunk with wine again. The younger daughter went in, had intercourse with him. As before, he was unaware of her lying down or getting up. As a result, both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their own father. When the older daughter gave birth to a son, she named him Moab. He became the ancestor of the nation known as the Moabites. When the younger daughter gave birth to a son, she named him ben Ami. He became the ancestor of the nation now known as the Ammonites. The reason, James and I were talking about this, and he said, do you ever wonder why God put that in there? I said, yeah. I said, I think we're about to find out. Because Lot knew Jesus, or Lot knew God as Savior. He did not know him as Lord. Abraham knew him as Savior and Lord. There are lots of people that know him as a rescuer. I need my marriage saved. Save my marriage. I need my family saved. Save my family. I need my finances saved. Save my finances. But they will never let him be Lord. Moab means son of my people. Lot's daughters only produced that of Lot. Okay? Throughout history, you can see their name battled with war, not peace. Lot's story ended in Genesis 19, although his selfishness did not. This is an example of Jesus, Savior and not Lord. Abraham didn't know didn't Abraham didn't just know Jehovah as Savior. He definitely made him Lord. Lot reproduced Lot. Abraham reproduced God's promises. What if Lot had had him had made him not just Savior but also Lord? What happens if we make him Lord in our lives? How will things change? What if we made Jesus Lord and Savior over our marriages, over our children, over our finances, over our careers, over our relationships, over our friendships? So this left me to the question of what if we only make Jesus Savior and not Lord? We have a lot of people that can say, Jesus saved me from this, but you look into their lives and you don't see that Jesus is Lord. Jesus' Savior emphasizes sins forgiven. Jesus is Lord emphasizes a reorientation in life, which includes sins forgiven. I'm no longer the king of my domain. He is. This reorientation changes everything. Jesus is Savior impacts me. Jesus is Lord impacts me and everyone around me. Jesus' as Savior is often deeply personal and private. Jesus is Lord retains the personal dynamic, but spreads out to impact everything and everyone around me. It is mission-oriented, sent ones, and seeks to reflect Jesus to others. Jesus' as Savior affects only those so-called spiritual aspects in life. Jesus is Lord affects all of our life. It's all encompassing. Everything is affected by it every day and everywhere, every way. It is not just limited to Sunday or a midweek program or more generally to the religious side of life, but lays at the center of life and thereby orients, shapes, and informs everything else around us. My concern, and I'm not alone, is that many people have decided to make Jesus their personal Savior, but have yet to truly embrace Him as Lord. The first ask people to seek forgiveness of sins. The second summons people to a lifetime of devoted discipleship to Jesus, while inviting others to follow along in the pursuit of the kingdom. The first one centers on yourself. The second one is Christ and his kingdom. 
Any model that switches the order will short circuit the controlling message of the gospel and effectively, effectively produce a mutated organism. Discipleship is not optional and it is not directed towards the few who choose to take Jesus seriously. With Christ, it's all or nothing. It was a summons with expectations. Jesus is Lord demands everything. Jesus is Savior does not. The first focuses on a lifetime. The second is a one-time decision. Why does he constantly say, choose, you have to choose him daily? Why is that? Why is that? Am I saved? Yes. Am I being saved? Yes. I was saved and I'm being saved. I was saved and I'm being saved. We have to know this. Because if Jesus is truly Lord in your life, everything around you will change. Pastor Annette got up here and did Becoming Who You Are. She talked about music in her life. She talked about TV shows in her life. She talked about the movies in our life. We should worry about our language. We should not look and sound just like everybody else. And what do we do? We go home and we make ourselves Lord. And because we make ourselves Lord, or because I make Him Lord, then we line up everything. If He's not making Jesus Lord, and I'm making Him Lord, we're really, we're, we're, we are. Because Jesus has to be Lord in my life, and Jesus has to be Lord in His life, and the two will connect. Do I submit to Him? Absolutely. But he has an obligation, responsibility to submit himself. What will it look like? So you see, there is a difference between calling Jesus Savior and making him Lord. And the title we choose to prioritize deeply affects the way we view and experience the entire gospel. All of it. You can absolutely say, I am saved. But how are you going to live the rest of your life? Are you going to allow Jesus to come in and maybe, just maybe, you can actually say, I may be wrong. Can we really say that? Can we say, maybe I let some things into my life that I shouldn't have allowed them to be there. Maybe I entertain some, some uh, things in darkness that... I thought we're innocent. I saw that stupid movie trailer for it. I know. Let me tell you. I'm telling myself for a minute. Because I entertained that stuff. I was like, the scarier the better. The scarier the better. And then I, couldn't, then I wondered why. James would work nights. And I'd go and make sure every single door was locked. And had all the alarms set on the doors. And I made the kids come and sleep in the room with me because what if somebody broke in the window and stole my kids in the middle of the night so let's just sleep them all together. It's created fear. And I'm like, but I, the scarier the better. You know, I can handle this. No, I couldn't. I was a sissy. But I shouldn't have been entertaining it. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching this trailer pop up and I said, oh no, you are not being resurrected. I told that stupid clown, he's the reason why I can't stand clowns. Him and the poltergeist. And I said, no, 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 no. You do not get to infect my grandchildren. And you do not get to infect my... I, and I, when I say grandchildren, I have a lot of grandchildren, not the ones that were just birthed to me, but the ones that have been promised to me. So my sons and daughters are going to stand up in their house and they're going to say no to this crap. And my grandchildren are not going to have to endure for what the parents have let into their lives because they're actually going to let Jesus close some doors in their own lives. So I understand my responsibility of opening some of this up, but now my sons and daughters are going to actually let Jesus close it. But I'm telling you, that's making Jesus Lord. It's saying, maybe I was wrong. Because I used to think, I can watch anything, it doesn't matter. I can listen to anything, it doesn't matter. But it does matter. It says what you hear. Why does it tell you to protect what you hear? Why does it tell you to protect what you see? Why does it tell you to protect what you say? 
is death and life from the power of life. And whatever you bear is what you're going to eat. If you want to speak death, and you want to speak perversion, and you want to speak these filthy words, what do you think is going to come back? we got to stop that. This young lady, I know, you knew I was going to go there. Okay, and I forgot the plates. Okay, but I'm going to tell you what she did to me. She was telling me a story about some things that she does with her youth. And it made me excited because, first off, I know that you're going to bring a lot of that into our life. Not just the community, but in here, too. But she took these plates, and I actually, um, I want to do it. I'm going to use these. I'm going to do Robbie Stan. Oh, I'll fix. Oh, my kids right here. Here, on the back of this. I'm going to put my kids in the side Okay? On the back of that, I want you to write at least four words negatively that affected you in your life that someone said or spoke over you. Maybe you even did it to yourself. Do I need to give you a piece of paper? <laughs> okay? Just four words. Or whatever, whatever it is. Four things that were negatively spoken over you or maybe you even spoke them over yourself. Okay, now on the other side, I want you to flip it over and I want you to say four words that you said to someone else that you know caused them harm or caused them damage. No, you're not. Because I would not want to do that to myself, Tyler, so I'm not going to make you do that. I know. Actually, it makes me want to vomit just thinking about having to do that out loud. See, this is what I got one-on-one -on -one in my office. She was so gracious about it. I'm sweating now. Just thinking about it. Okay? So on one side, it's the four words that someone said about you. And y'all do it too. Think about it. What is something, what does somebody call you? What does someone say to you? For me, growing up, constantly, everyone spoke about I've always been a big girl, so they've always made sure to, to you talk about bullying, Bully, being bullied in your own house sucks, and that's exactly what happened. I've always been a thick girl, I always loved athletics, I always loved, I wanted to be in, in, in athletics and to play softball and to play volleyball and do all these things, but I constantly had someone telling me, you're too big. You can't do it. You're not athletic enough, Lorinda. And I didn't have enough of identity to tell them to, and go do it. So I let them stop me. So what did I do? What was the first thing that comes into, into knowing who you are is you listen to what everybody tells you that you're not. So what do you do? You go out and you try to please people to make them happy because then that'll make you happy. But I lived a life of, of, of doing self-damage to myself. So I say that. What was it that was spoken over you? All I kept hearing is you can't do it. Guess what creeps in, guys? When you're trying to walk this walk and do what you know Jesus has called you to do. You can't do it, Lorinda. You're still too big. You still can't worship the way you want to. You still can't do all of that. But I'll tell you what. Every day now you'll know, but you didn't know before, every day that I come to this altar is a living sacrifice for me. Every day. Because I have to remember that it doesn't matter what you think of me, it's what I think of him. That's what matters. But even my worship wants to get stolen. What's getting stolen out of your life?
I want you to take those papers and I want you to tear them up. And I want you to remember what you put on those papers. And you don't get to say it to yourselves just like you don't get to say it to other people anymore. If you called yourself a loser, you don't get to call someone a loser anymore. If you called yourself a, 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 I don't know, say one that you want to share. Just say one. Okay? Then you don't get to say it anymore. And you don't get to confess that. You don't get anybody to say that you are, and you don't get to confess that over anybody else anymore. It's done. But you have to know it's done. And you have to make a choice. We have to make a choice. I have to make a choice. I don't know if I did that justice or not, but that is, it messed me up because I tell you what, Sarah, I filled up a plate full of words. I filled up an entire plate full of words. I knew what people had said about me, but the Lord said, now I want you to turn it around. And what did you say about people? Took a whole other direction. He said, do you see what that did to you and what it kept you from? Imagine what it's keeping them from. Our words are powerful. They're powerful. But as much as they can bring in the kingdom of darkness, it can also make the darkness flee. That's the part I want to focus on. So we don't get to say these things anymore. We don't get to bring these negative things in our life. James, we screwed up. Okay? Okay? We did, we, we did some things that opened up some doors in our kids' life. But you know what? Our word and our yes changed it. Our word and our yes changed it for more than just us. Your word and your yes changes it for more than just you. Don't just make Jesus Savior. Make Him Lord. Make Him Lord. You have to make the adjustments in your life and is it hard? Yes, but is it worth it? Absolutely. It is worth it. Huh? Lot knew exactly where he was. Lot knew what he entertained. Right? We got to acknowledge where we are. So if you haven't, if you've just made Jesus your Savior and you haven't made him Lord, I just ask that you just take some time. And you tell him to come into your life, come into your, come into your living space and give him access to move some things around, cut some things off, turn some things off, kick some things out. Maybe he's got to rearrange your friends. Maybe he's got to rearrange you. Maybe your thought process. Maybe you've got to get off your lazy butt and actually spend some time with him. So that way you can stop letting other people tell you who, are, who you are and actually listen to what Jesus says who you are. Amen? Father, I just pray that I did your word justice. Lord, I pray where it was an error, I ask that you forgive me and I ask this body forgives me. Father, I just thank you that I truly know that we have an opportunity because we know we've been saved, but we also want to make you Lord. Because the word says... Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a reason why the two are there. So Lord, we don't want to just have some, we want it all. So Lord, have your way in our lives. Have your way in my life. I can't speak for anyone else. I can only speak for mine. But Lord, I ask that you have your way. May you always be Jesus. Jesus, may you always be Savior and may you always be Lord in this house, in this house, in this body. That we just don't lead people to the cross. That we also show them the path that you've put before us to lead us into a life of victory. It's not a one-time deal. We sign up forever. Because we know we're, it's an ever-living God. It's an ever-living life. And it's one full of life. And it's one full of abundance. And it's a good life. And that's the one that we've been called to live. I love you, Jesus. Father, I pray that we walk out those doors not the same way that we walked in. May we be a little bit more knowledgeable, have a little bit more courage, have a little bit more wisdom to go out and do what you've called us to do. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.